So this is the cell I was talking about. This is called a brain cell or a neuron. It's got this, this kind of star-shaped body with lots of little projections called dendrites. And then there is this long filament called an axon. Um, so you, you can, this is not to scale. So if you, ha if you have a cell that lives in your brain, the axon could run all the way down uh, into your spinal cord. And from there, another axon can run all the way down to your, the tip of your toe, for instance. So it'll be several thousand times uh, the size of the body. But this is the basic idea. This is like a, a, a schematic representation. So electrical signals are generated in the soma or the cell. Soma is just the body of the cell. So that's where the electricity is generated and it's transmitted along the axon all the way down to these things called axon terminals where some chemicals are released. That's how brain cells communicate with each other by using these chemicals. Have you heard of chemicals involved in nerves? Think of a name that might be applicable to that. Nerves and chemicals that communicate, that help nerve cells communicate with each other. We, we looked at this briefly. You will learn about this in year 11. I'm sure 10th or 11th you will learn about this. This is membrane potential. This is inside, this is the outside. And all the blue dots are the potassium, uh, the sodium ions, and the yellow dots are the potassium ions. So sodium is on the outside, potassium is on the inside. Uh, but there is more sodium pushed out. So for every one potassium ion that comes in, two sodium ions are pushed out. So the net effect is to make the inside negative in relation to the outside. And if you have a recording uh, between the inside and the outside, if you record the electrical potential, it, it comes out at about minus 70 millivolts. So this is a resting membrane potential. And uh, so, so that's a sodium channel, that's a potassium channel, and uh, they open when the potential reaches a certain level. So here it is. This is what happens when the membrane potential changes and the sodium channels open. You can see that the sodium comes into the cell and the, where, that, uh, where that process happens, the inside of the membrane is no longer negative in relation to the outside. What that means is you get a, a reversal of the membrane potential and that lasts for a few milliseconds, and that is what we call an action potential. So this is the electrical pulse that travels down the nerve uh, along the axon and carries that message to the neighboring neuron or the muscle cell or whichever cell that nerve connects to. So this is the action potential. So, uh, and where does it end? It ends in this synaptic, these axon terminals. Uh, it ends, is called a, a synapse. A synapse is a junction uh, between two nerve cells or between a nerve cell and a muscle cell or other types of cells. Essentially, when the action potential arrives at the end of the axon, to the axon terminal, it causes release of, well, it causes calcium to enter the, the axon terminal. And when calcium enters the axon terminal, it causes these chemicals that are stored in the axon terminal to be released into the synapse. And those chemicals are called, it's called a neurotransmitter transmission between nerve cells okay so it transmits impulses from one nerve cell to another so that's what a neurotransmitter does and uh, the neurotransmitter binds to another bunch of channels on the opposite membrane and it causes those channels to open up and that allows positive and negative ions depending on what type of neurotransmitter it is either positive or uh, negative ions to be released into the cell. So if it is a positive ion that is entering the other cell, then that cell also becomes depolarized. It can generate an action potential. So that's how that, uh, that's how nerve cells communicate with each other. How do we know this much about it? And it is largely down to this guy. Um, he's a, a Spanish neuroscientist from the late 19th and early 20th century called Santiago Ramon y Cajal. So he made very detailed studies of brains of lots of different animals and he developed techniques to visualize brain cells but before that the brain just looked like a big jelly wobbly big thing and it, it wasn't possible to separate out the cells within the brain like it was possible to do with other organs in the body so if you take a bit of muscle or uh, a bit of liver or a kidney or something you can put it under the microscope and you can see it's made of cells but with the brain it was not possible until he developed techniques to stain those brain cells and they could then see in detail their structure. And he made these drawings, which are really beautiful drawings. And in fact, they are highly regarded in the world of art as in the world of neuroscience. Uh, and there was an exhibition called Butterflies of the Soul based on Cajal's drawings. 
Um, so this is one of his drawings, and this is an outdoor presentation of what a brain cell in the mouse brain looks like. So that's a nerve cell that you can see in the middle there. And then you have these branches that, that repeatedly branch out that increases the surface area of the membrane by a, a factor of several thousand. Uh, so that, those are the dendrites. And then you have this uh, thin filament marked A, which is the axon that carries a nerve impulse from the cell body to somewhere else. And so that's another one of Cajal's drawings. That's a schematic of how this appears in, as a whole. So the there are six layers to the uh, gray matter, A, B, C, D, and E, and F. And the main cells that uh, I showed you in the previous picture are in layer B, that's layer four, and their branches go up to the more superficial layers and branch out to produce this beautiful pattern of arborizing fibers. And, and if you look at it in a more um, simplified form, this is essentially what it looks like. The main cell that I talked about in layer four, it's also called a pyramidal cell because it's got a pyramidal shape. And it has got this dendrites, which uh, I've just drawn one here, but there are many thousands of them. Uh, and they receive the synapses from cells around them. And uh, uh, they also have, those synapses also activate other cells around that cell. Uh, and their job is to oppose the effect of whatever is happening at the level of the dendrite. So I've drawn this in green, and that green means it is a, a, an excitatory synapse. The neurotransmitter that's being released at that synapse makes the action potential more likely. It makes positive ions go into the cell. But at the same time, the exact same thing activates these other cells called interneurons, and their job is to inhibit the cell. So that's a red synapse there in the middle. And the job of the red synapse is to, it, re it releases an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means it makes negatively charged ions go into the cell and makes the act action potential less likely. So you have this balance between excitation uh, and inhibition of the dendrites and the cell body that keeps it in a finely tuned balance all the time. And sometimes excitation wins, uh, inhibition uh, fails in, uh, for a bit, and then an action potential is generated and this pyramidal cell will fire its action potential down its axon to wherever it goes. And as soon as it's fired, the same feedback inhibitory mechanism is activated and the cell becomes inhibited again. So th that's a kind of idea we have of how brain cells maintain themselves between excitation and inhibition. So, so that's great. And that is something that we have acquired through the course of this knowledge has come about mainly from Cajal's work, but through uh, this, this work was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1906. Um, so it's well over 100 years ago, but um, I showed you Hodgkin and Huxley's experiments on the giant scoot accident in the 1950s, which um, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1963. And, and that kind of carried on through the course of the 20th century to get us to this point where we have a pretty good idea what happens at the cellular level in terms of how uh, electrical activity is generated in the brain. Um, so this is just a, a, an animated version of the same thing. So you can see that I just got the synapses lighting up there. So the, um, when the synapse lights up in, in, in green and yellow, that means there is excitation going on. When it lights up in red, that means there is inhibition going on. So that's the um, fundamental idea uh, of this balance between excitation and inhibition. Just to zoom in a little bit on what happens at these synaptic levels. So you have the sodium channels opening and uh, uh, that op they open for a very brief period of time. And then uh, the, the potassium channels open and they pump potassium out of the cell. So it reverses the, uh, the, the, that action potential very quickly. So electrically that is recording. It, it's a very brief spike uh, on the electrical recording. And then uh, when that action potential reaches the end of the axon, uh, it causes calcium channels to open and calcium when it comes into the cell, causes these neurotransmitter, which are stored in little bubbles called vesicles. They fuse with the axon membrane and, and then uh, release the neurotransmitter into the synapse. The one labeled uh, glutamate is uh, an excitatory neurotransmitter. So when it binds to its receptors, those receptors are also ion channels. They open and they allow positively charged ions to go into the cell and therefore causes excitation that the sodium and calcium goes into the cell causes excitation. GABA, on the other hand, GABA aminobutyric acid, 
is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Its, its receptor is a chloride channel. So when GABA binds to its receptor, it opens up, it allows chloride to go into the cell, and that causes, uh, obviously, the inside of the membrane to become more negative. So it, causes, it makes an action potential less likely. So uh, it's excitation and inhibition, uh, respectively. So that's basically, and these neurotransmitters are reuptaken and they're dealt with in a number of different ways. So this is what happens at the level of the sinus. This is how the network is constructed. But how does this result? How does this network of brain cells create all of these things that our brain does? It produces all our sensations. It produces sight, sign, sight, uh, uh, hearing, or uh, touch, taste. It generates all our movements, all our thoughts, all our emotions. We can produce speech, it produces all our imagination. How does, how does all of that come from a bunch of electrical cells connected together? What do you think? Well, there's the short answer is we don't know. This is the, the, the reason why uh, the brain is so unendingly fascinating that uh, it's just inexplicably complicated. We know, I told you last time, that um, one way of studying what the brain does is to look at what happens when the brain goes wrong. So, you, so that's what neurologists do. We treat people with diseases of the brain and we can see what happens when diseases affect certain areas of the brain. So in this case, uh, we can now do uh, brain scans. Now the technology has advanced so you can take very detailed pictures of the inside of the brain uh, and find out what's happening with people who have these neurological diseases. Yes, uh, S. Hilal, this is a, an MRI of the brain. And uh, so it, it just shows you what happens when there is a, a problem affecting, in this case, the front of the brain, in this case, the side of the brain, in this case, and there will be cases where it is affected, uh, affecting maybe the back of the brain or the top of the brain. And we can look at that person and see what it is that they can't do. And we can then correlate what we see on the scan to what, what is wrong with the patient. And that gives us an idea of what that bit of the brain's doing normally. And from those types of studies, now th this has obviously been going on for a, a few hundred years. We have not been able to do scans for that long. I mean, MRI scans really have only been available for the last 30 years. And before that, maybe, maybe 15 years before that, we started to be able to do uh, CT scans. So um, it's really only, become widely used during my lifetime, my career as a doctor. But before that, we had to rely on very primitive tests and often just post-mortem examination. So you had to wait for the patient to die from something. And you, and you document, you write down what was wrong with the patient. You know, could they not see? Could they not speak? Could they, were they paralyzed on one side, et cetera, et cetera. And then a lot of the time, we didn't have any treatment anyway, and people died of these things. And then you did a post-mortem and you found out what the problem was in the brain and said, aha, so this is what happened. This is the reason why they, uh, why they couldn't move their left side or they could not speak or they could not uh, see or whatever. So you can get these uh, ideas from studying diseases of the brain correlating with certain physical symptoms. Um, and that's generally speaking how things advance in the understanding of what the human brain does for many years. And we have this idea of the different bits of the brain doing different things. So this is a picture of the left side of the brain, and you have a division called the central sulcus, and the, and the bit in front of it is mainly associated with movement. The bit behind that is mainly associated with sensation, and the, this bit on the side called the temporal lobe, particularly on the left, has got an area which is quite important in speech. Uh, if, you, if you have any diseases affecting that area, you cannot recognize what people are saying to you. You won't be able to produce words. There are other areas on both sides of the temporal lobes which are important for hearing. The back of the brain called the occipital lobe is important for seeing. So if you have problems affecting that part of the brain, you get problems with your vision or you may lose your vision. And then in, or, in order to be able to see what is written on the page or, or whatever you're reading, and make sense of that, you have to have a connection between the vision area of the brain and the language speech area of the brain. So somewhere around the top of the left side uh, seems to be really important for reading. So we have a reasonable idea of which parts of the brain are important for which functions. And this has largely come, come about through studying brain diseases. And this idea of uh, different areas of the brain being important for different functions has become very popular in the public imagination. Going back 
uh, 200 years, this idea of a homunculus, as it is called, and it's Latin for a little man. And so if you take the motor part of the brain, so this is this, here is the central sulcus, and the bit in front of it seems to be most important for movement. So that is called the motor area of the brain. And uh, if you look at what each different bit of the motor area does, it's not exactly proportional to the size of that body. So the most the highest representation, the area with the biggest representation is the hand, because that's the thing that we use with the greatest level of precision, particularly the thumb has a big area of representation. And then mouth and throat and so on has a reasonably big area. But the rest of your body, the trunk and the legs have a very small area of the motor cortex devoted to that. And if you draw that proportionate to the area of representation in the brain, in the motor cortex, it looks a bit like this. So this idea that there is a little man sitting in your brain in controlling uh, all of these things that happens in your body it was very popular in the early 19th century in uh, much of scientific writing. Well, popular literature, including Frankenstein, for instance. Right. Uh, but it's not, we don't just do that. We, we don't just move and speak and so on. We have all of these other things that goes on. We, we experience emotions. We form memories. So we, we have certain preferences for certain things and we which makes us who we are which is the basis of our personalities and the differences between us how about those things how, so it's, we're not talking about abnormal function we're talking about the normal things that's brain does how does that happen within the brain that's that's a lot more complicated and uh, again su studying when the brain goes wrong can be useful and sometimes it is pretty rare for these type of things. When these things come along, it becomes really famous. So one such famous case, which enabled us to gain some insights into what a personality is, or what makes someone then, what's the, what's the basis of human personality, is this guy called Phineas Gage. He was a railway worker in America in the 19th century, and he was doing some drilling and uh, blasting in the construction of a new railroad. And he, there's a picture of him with a, a big iron road this was being drilled down into something and the, the explosive went off and it went through his cheek and this is a picture of what actually happened he had his mouth open when it happened it just went straight under his cheekbone right up into his head came out of the top of his head and flew straight out so it made a big hole in his brain basically and that picture shows you what the disruption was uh, in terms of what the um, uh, what the injury did to his brain and he did not even lose consciousness apparently he was he was just sitting there in a dazed fashion with a big hole in his head and he was taken to a doctor who patched up his wounds the best he could. He became very ill for a while with an infection, but uh, did not nearly die, but didn't die, and then recovered. And when he recovered, um, he was a completely different person. He was not the guy who had the injury before. And it was studied extensively. He was exhibited at various medical meetings in America. Um, so this was the description. So previous to his injury, he hadn't been to school. He's not an educated man, but he was a smart, shrewd man, and he had a well-balanced mind. But after this injury, he became gross, profane, coarse, and vulgar to such a degree that his society was intolerable, decent people. This is recording. And in this regard, his mind was radically changed. So decidedly that his friend had acquaintances that he was no longer gauge. So he became a completely different person after this injury. He was a medical curiosity for the rest of his life. Uh, he became obsessed with this, this steel rod that he carried around everywhere with him. So we then understood vast areas of the brain uh, that we really didn't know anything about. I mean, I told you about the movement part of the brain, the sensory part of the brain, uh, the seeing and the uh, hearing part of the brain. But all of that added up to maybe about 25% of the brain. The other 75%, we didn't know what it was there for. And this was an exact, this was an insight into what maybe the other bits of the brain did. So this part, this was a, the frontal part of the brain and it looked like an injury to the frontal part of his brain it could result in changes to the personality of that individual. And then another example to do with memory was another famous patient. He was called H.M. in his life. He, he died in 2008 and we know his name was Henry Malaysen. His injury was inflicted by a surgeon. So somebody did an operation on his brain. He had epilepsy and it could not be controlled with medication. A surgeon called um, Scoville in uh, Toronto decided to remove the parts of the brain which uh, was responsible for this man's epilepsy. And he had epilepsy coming from both uh, sides of the brain and this thing called the hippocampus, which is the inner part of the temporal lobe. Uh, so Scoville removed both his hippocampus at an operation. It helped his epilepsy, but he lost the ability to form new memories. And the operation took place in 1953. Uh, he died in 2008. He did not 
form any new memories after 1953. So you could ask him about anything. He was born in 1926. So anything before 1953, he would be able to give you a coherent answer. You could remember everything about his childhood and uh, uh, his experience of going to school and everything else. But all of the other events that happened after 1953, he had no memory of. So every day was a new day for him. Every time he met somebody, it was like meeting them for the first time. Uh, and if you told him something, you would have to tell him every time you saw him. But he could learn new skills. So if you tried to get him to operate a machine, say a coffee machine or a, uh, how to make tea, he could do that. You could teach him to type. So he could learn skills, but he could not retain facts. So this told us something really important about which bits of the brain are important for memory. And he became a very famous patient studied by hundreds of neuropsychology students who were interested in, interested in memory. So, so these are these uh, rare examples of brain diseases telling us a little bit about other aspects of brain functioning. So let's, but there's a lot of other things that goes, there's so many other things, learning disability or, or dementia or memory loss um, or psychosis when there is abnormal thinking. You do brain scans on those patients, everything looks fine. There's completely normal looking brains. You do post-mortem examinations, they look completely fine. You do microscopic examinations of the brain cells, they look fine. So why do these things happen? So these are clearly not diseases of brain cells. These are not diseases of the structure of the brain. Um, so how, how do you explain that? So we have this model based on what we think goes on at the level of the cells. And we have some medications that affect those processes. But that's not what we deal with. So if you're dealing with epilepsy, for instance, that's a problem with the electrical activity of the whole network. So unless you are trying to treat um, problems of brain cells, you can't really rely on the medications we have. But we don't just treat that. We treat people who have uh, these brain diseases and they are affected by a lot of other things that goes on around them. So in the end, we are so far away from what is happening at the level of the brain cell that we've almost lost all contact with uh, the reality of what we're trying to, trying to understand. So. This is the phenomenon of emergence. And a lot of those brain functions that we talked about, of emotions, of imagination, of thoughts, all of those things are not fundamentally products of brain electrical activity, but it emerges as a complex thing from within those brain activities. So that's a phenomenon of emergence, which is defined as entities and patterns that arise through interactions of smaller or simpler entities that themselves do not exhibit such properties. Just to um, explain that further, if you study biology, well, biology emerges as a result of interactions of molecules as you study in chemistry. And chemistry, in turn, is a, is, is a product of interactions of elementary particles, of atoms, uh, as you study in physics. So one thing emerges from another, and the whole point is that you cannot understand the uh, thing that has emerged by studying the components. So for instance, if you study physics, you can't understand chemistry from that. You have to study chemistry. If you know all about chemistry, you can't understand biology, even though human living things are made of uh, chemicals. Um, we can't understand that, but biology has its own properties. So what we know about what goes on with the electrical activity of the brain does not explain what emerges as a result of those uh, interactions. So just to explain that, so um, we have this traditional view of what scientific disciplines are like. Uh, at one end are the social sciences, so the humanities, which are based on uh, studying people's behavior, uh, interaction between people, which are generally seen as, as less scientific, if you like. But then the psychologists could say, well, sociology is just applied psychology, where you know, you're just studying interactions between people's mental state because they're, they're behaving in a certain way. But then neuroscientists or biologists could say, well, we can decipher psychology from what we study in biology. We can understand how the brain works and then, then tell you how people are going to behave. But chemists can say, well, biology says applied chemistry. Uh, but then the physicists say, well, chemistry is just applied physics. So 
It's nice green top. And then the way over there is the purest form of mathematics, the cure of all science, the purest form of science, the cure of all science is mathematics, because ultimately uh, theoretical physics and applied physics is just applied mathematics. And on top of that, so the philosophers were, you know, the, the ideas of philosophy govern all sciences. So that's the idea that we, we traditionally have, that this is of the, um, the uh, hierarchical model of science. But that's not, strictly speaking, true. It's a circular relationship between all of these things, where down here, what might be considered the imaginary world of um, sociology, of arts and literature and the humanities. So you, so you have this idea that the world of humanities, which is art and, and literature and sporting achievement and all of these things, lead to a philosophical view of the world. And when you apply that to solving a problem, that is where fields of mathematics emerge from. So the, a mathematical explanation of the world is a philosophical view of what goes on in the world, which is what leads to its application in theoretical and experimental physics, which then leads on to the other more visible forms of science. And so essentially the circular view of the hierarchy of sciences is probably more correct um, or more applicable to the real world. So to talk about emergence, so how do these complex phenomena emerge from the interaction of these things? So here is a, here is a little bird called a starling. It's a pretty unremarkable bird. And if you looked at one of them, you would say, well, that's nothing, nothing much. Uh, but when they fly in a flock, they do this. And this is called a murmuration of starlings. And they, each bird follows very simple rules. They fly at this, the same distance to each other. And if they are beginning to drift apart, they come closer together. If they're beginning to come closer together, they drift apart. And so they try and maintain the same distance with each other. And when they do that, the flock of birds as a whole exhibit this kind of behavior. It is a phenomenal thing to watch, a murmuration of starlings. They do that when they're being attacked by a predator. So typically when a hawk attacks a small bird, the whole flock behaves like this, which completely puts off uh, the predator. It, it can't focus, it loses its sense of direction. It, it knocks its GPS off the, off the course, and then the predator cannot lock onto a single bird. So this is one example of a, an emergent phenomenon which comes out of behavior of particles which follow simple rules. Um, so the components follow simple rules, but the system exhibits complex behavior. That's the idea of emergence. And, and here is another one, you see it all the time. So um, this is traffic. Well, you might know everything about cars and you might be a very expert mechanic, you can fix any car anytime, anywhere, but you don't know anything about traffic. You can't explain how traffic jams happen simply because you know everything about cars cars. So it might look like this or it might look like the other. Uh, so it's, it's, it's again, it arises from the interaction between all the vehicles on the world and they themselves follow simple rules. There are rules of the world. You have to drive at a certain speed, you have to not crash into anything else and uh, you have to keep going until you get to your destination. But when they come together, they exhibit this complex behavior which you cannot predict by studying the components. So that's an, that's an example of than emergent dynamical phenomena. And this is what goes on in the brain. And the interaction between the brain cells generate these emergent phenomena, which we experience as the world around us. So this is where we are at in terms of studying what goes on in the brain, uh, and not just in the brain, but all biological systems as a whole. And this is the idea of systems biology. This is where you have computational and mathematical analysis and modeling of biological systems. And the modeling is big right now because of COVID. Everybody is into dynamical causal models and things like that. This is to mirror in a computer uh, what goes on uh, real world by adding all these factors in and the interactions between these different factors and then try and understand how the system might behave over time. And we take the same approach to studying what goes on in the brain and this is a field we call network neuroscience uh, so you see the brain not as its individual parts you don't worry so much about what an individual cell does or what the what a receptor does or uh, what a certain neurotransmitter does we just study what happens in the whole thing and you reconstruct the brain as a network and study the behavior of that network 
Okay. So how many of you are on social media, on Instagram or uh, Twitter? Um, does this make sense? Um, so if that is you, Bilal, um, that might be a friend of yours, and that might be another friend. And they are connected to a bunch of people. Each person is connected to a group of people. And so they are, they are most closely connected to people who they know, people, people who are uh, close to them, whether they go to the same school or they live in the same town or, or whatever. Uh, and some people may have a few long, long range connections, right? Um, the point is, if you have a network of this sort, uh, and this is how social networks are, not, not just social media networks, but just social networks in general, uh, that uh, most people are closely connected to people in their vicinity, but any person can be linked to any other person in the world by six connections, okay? So, so for instance, how would I know, say, let's say a random person in, uh, in Russia. Uh, well, I don't, I have no connections to Russia. I've never been to Russia, so I have no connections to Russia. But you could say, so this, idea, this is this idea of six handshakes. So somebody has shaken hands with somebody who has shaken hands with somebody. So, well, I know my friend who knows the local MP, who knows Boris Johnson, who knows Putin, Putin knows a Russian MP, who knows this man in Russia. So between me and this random person in Russia, there are five people, okay? So that's the idea of six degrees of separation. The most you take six steps between any two parts of the network, and that is called a small world network. Uh, there are other networks you can create regular networks or every part of the network is equally connected to everything else you can produce random networks where people are connected completely at random they're not any more likely to be connected to their neighbors that's far away no far away parts etc but in the real world this is how networks emerge it's the same with all emerging networks not just uh, social networks you can look at um, financial markets you can look at the airports uh, network for instance i mean you can fly from any airport in the world to any other airport in the world. There is no direct flight from any, every airport to every other airport. That would be very expensive and very inefficient. What tends to happen is that in uh, in the UK, for instance, all the all the UK airports are connected to uh, Heathrow, which is the main what we call the hub airport. And then there are long range connections from um, from Heathrow to other major hubs. So I could fly from here to Beijing and then from there to any other city in China. Um, so, you know, that, that's the kind of setup that natural networks take. And this is the case with brain networks as well. It takes a bit small world properties. And so where we are at in studying what the brain does is about understanding the behavior of brain networks. We have technology that allows us to do that. We now can uh, show the, uh, we can map the networks in the brain. Um, we can see what the connections between different parts of the brain are. But you can also build up an idea of connections based on electrical activity uh, with the functioning of the brain. So when people are doing certain things, which parts of the brain are active? And you can link them up together and construct what we call a functional network. And that tells us uh, how, this, how this is going to behave. So th this is where my research is at the moment. This is me wearing an EEG cap, and that's my uh, research student. And uh, uh, that's uh, uh, an EEG, and you can see that it's a very messy thing. It's, it's a squiggly line. It doesn't really, uh, it's an electrical recording from my brain, but it doesn't uh, tell you anything about what I'm doing or what I'm thinking or anything like that. Uh, but what, what do we do with this? So we, what we can do is then, uh, well, we apply some mathematics. And this is, this is a guy called Fourier, and he, he basically said any signal can be represented as some of sine waves and cosine waves. Uh, you, you hopefully have learned in, uh, in trigonometry about sine and cosine, uh, but if you look at this circle going round and round, any angle um, will produce a waveform when it goes round and round like that. That angle is the sine, that wave can be represented as a sine of the angle it creates to the x-axis. So you take a bunch of sine and cosine waves, you can add them together, and it gives you uh, any signal, uh, any complex signal like this. Uh, so what we do is you take this complex signal, break it down its, into its uh, co constituent sine and cosine waves, and we look at how these 
um, sine and cosine waves are related between all these different points on the head from which we'll, we, ex uh, we record the EG. And where these, uh, this is called a, a, a power spectrum, where the power spectrum is similar, you can assume that there is some connection between those bits of the brain. And you can build a network of uh, connections between the brain. And what that leads to is an understanding of how functional connections in the brain uh, uh, exist in various uh, normal states and abnormal states. So you can do this in people who are trying to read a book or trying to think of happy thoughts or feeling sad or they are unconscious or any of these things and gives you a further insight into what the brain networks do. Um, we are at the foothills really. This is, we don't even have uh, the mathematics to explain uh, the behavior of networks. Uh, so all of that is in the future and it is for your generation to, to pursue and to make new discoveries in, um, but it is an unendingly fascinating area. So that's kind of a, a, a tour of brain research has been over the last 300 years. Um, so, but the, the points are the same. In general, we've gone from being scared and frightened of, uh, of, of brain diseases to understanding a great deal about it because people ask questions. And if one thing you want to take away from this is to be curious, you know, if you be interested in stuff and question everything, there is no dogma. If everyone says, yeah, that's just the way it is, you just accept that, you should never accept that. If it doesn't make sense to you, it is wrong. If it, and you should explore it until it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense to you, you have something to contribute probably. And, and, and the thing is to believe, uh, because when we were young, we were never really told uh, that um, that we would be capable of doing what we ended up doing. And, and a lot of us ended up in these places because, well, purely by accident. Um, the world is different now. We are, you're not growing up in uh, 1980s India. Um, so there will be, a, 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 the world in front of you is, is completely different. So you, you got to, uh, to expect that of yourself. It doesn't have to, it, it doesn't matter what field you're going to do that in. It could be sport, it could be music, it could be uh, literature, it could be art, any of those fields. Uh, whatever you are interested in, whatever you feel is cool, uh, you have to believe that that is, that is your field and you can make uh, great leaps in that. Mm -hmm.